So here we are, Genesis Project. Today, uh, if you remember last our last series, Scandalous Stories from the Bible, we talked about a guy named Abraham. Now, what was scandalous about the story of Abraham was that Abraham had a real hard time telling the truth, didn't he? He would go to these places and then he would tell these kings that his wife was actually a sister and his wife, Sarah, was so beautiful that they would want to marry her. And uh, then he would get in trouble and it ended up God would work it out for good. But again and again, Abraham would tell these lies and Abraham got himself into trouble. And what was interesting about that particular story was that Abraham passed along the same lying genes to his son Isaac, who passed on the same lying genes to his son um, Jacob, and Jacob passed them on to his 12 sons who threw their one brother into a pit and eventually sold him into slavery. And that we saw that there was, there was, a, there was a correlation between the first one who didn't take care of uh, this problem in his life and it passed on down to four generations. So we're going to take a look again at the person of Abraham today. And um, I'm going to tell you this story and kind of, we're going to do it in chapters. We're going to call each point a chapter today and tell it a little bit more like a story in a storybook um, form as we go along. So I started to say this and let me finish this thought. If you're new to Shoreline Community Church, in that bulletin, there's a white piece of paper that has notes that has some blanks on it. Here you go, Gigi. I'm sorry. I stole that from you. And uh, if you'd like to follow along with us, we'd love for you to do that up on the... Uh, up on the screen, there'll be some fill-ins for you. We'll be glad to give you a pen from uh, Shoreline Community Church. If one of our guys can't make it to you, ask any of the ladies. They have 50 of them in their pocketbook. So, Abraham. Abraham, the father of two nations. Abraham is the father of the nation of Israel, and Abraham is the father of the Palestinian nation as well. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But as we start this, I really couldn't start this first chapter. I, I labored over this title of this first chapter of our story today. If this offends you, I apologize. There's some people who don't like this word in their home, but uh, I'm gonna, I just could not settle on a better word than this. So chapter one of our story is this, man, that guy's stupid. If you're offended by that, put whatever word you would like in there for that, but um, that's just all I could come up with for this. Because here's the story. Abraham is now 85 years old. God has promised him that he would be the father of many nations. And Abraham is like, uh, I'm 85. When, when's this going to happen? This is like time's running out, right? And so Abraham, I, I'm sure, is kind of wondering how this is all going to come to pass. He's wondering how God's going to make the promise happen. Did God really promise it? Maybe he just dreamed this angel came to him. I don't know. But, you know, so... Abraham's wife, in, in this chapter of Genesis, her name is still Sarai, but we're going to call her Sarah because God changes her name to Sarah. For those purists here, we're just going to use Sarah today. But his wife Sarah comes to him. Now, this is amazing to me, this part of the story, okay? Sarah comes to Abraham, and she offers her servant Hagar to Abraham to father or to be the mother of her children. In other words, she offers another woman to have sex with her husband. I don't know about you. Now, I, I, I mean, ladies, this just isn't a good idea. Guys, I, I mean, I, I, we just have to be honest here for just a second, okay? There's no guy who's going to go, you know, I don't know. This doesn't seem like a good idea to me. Uh, you want me to have sex with another woman and for her to have my children? It doesn't sound like a, you know, Abraham does what most guys would do. That sounds like a great idea, honey. I like this. You know, you've had good ideas in the past, but this one, this one's a home run. I like it. Good idea, right? And so Abraham has a child with his wife's servant, Hagar. Now, is there anybody else here, but can anyone else see a flaw in this plan? Is it just me? So here's the deal. Hagar now is pregnant with her master's 
baby. How do you think the dynamic between Hagar and Sarah is going to go now? It goes exactly like you think it would. Hagar all of a sudden isn't working quite as much and she's pregnant and she wants to renegotiate her contract with Abraham and Sarah at this point. And she's thinking, you know what, we're, we're just going to have to rethink this whole thing. And she becomes a little hard to deal with for Sarah. Because, listen, Sarah thought, somehow in Sarah's mind, Sarah thought Hagar would be great with getting pregnant, great with giving up her baby, and would still want to be her servant. Little did she think that that probably wasn't going to go that way. So here's what Abraham does. And this is why I think Abraham's a really, really stupid guy. The conflict begins between Sarah and Hagar. And Abraham does what a lot of guys would do. He goes, you know what? That's just between the two. You guys work it out. Right? And you could just, just imagine how that went. This whole thing's a mess. This whole story is a mess. Because here's the thing. God had promised to Abraham and Sarah that he would make them the mother and the father of a great nation, of nations. As a matter of fact, he said, your children and your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the skies. But you know what? Here's what happened. Sarah and Abraham tried to take things into their own hands. Sarah and Abraham got bored waiting for God to fulfill his promise, and so they tried to do it on their own. So I want to point out just a couple of observations, a couple of lessons from this first part of our story. First of all is this, you cannot set aside God's laws and not expect tragic consequences. You can't go, okay, God, here's how you've set things up. I'm going to do it my way, and it's going to work out good. It doesn't work that way. See, Abraham did what was customary, okay? That was the custom of his day. There was nothing really wrong with what he did, but his actions contradicted God's plan, and he and his family ended up suffering as a result of it. Now, here's what I, how this ma- matches up with us in 2016. You know, God's plan has never been for broken homes and for remarriages. God's plan has always been one man, one woman, for better, for worse, rich or poor, sickness and health, till death do us part. That's always been God's plan. No matter what the laws and no matter what the states may say, no matter what is being told to us. God's plan has always been set in place, and his plan has always been good. And listen to this, and especially those of you who are younger and those of you who may be in the position where you're dating and may get married someday, but listen to what I'm about to say, because this is important. Marriage between believers and non-believers very seldom ever end up working well. There's always conflict. There's always um, a, a difference, a divergent in values. And from day one, between a believer and a non-believer, you're always going to have conflict, and you're setting yourself up for disaster. And then the fourth thing I, I kind of saw in this, and I think is applicable for us today, is this, that hasty and thoughtless marriages are not according to God's plans. The idea, we were talking about this a little bit last night uh, with some of the students that I had the pleasure of having dinner with last night. The first thing in the, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right, the love chapter, what's the very first thing it says? Love is, say that, it's patient. Love is patient. You know what? If we have to throw things together and we can't wait and we have to do it now, you know what? We're setting ourselves up to be outside of God's perfect plan because when love is of God, you know what? It works right. It's not thrown together and it's not hastily done. God wants to bless marriage. God wants to bless our union. God wants to bless our relationship. And that happens when we do it the right way. Amen? So here's the words we use in a marriage ceremony. Marriage is not to be uh, entered into unadvisedly or lightly, but reverently, discreetly, advisedly, soberly, 
and in the fear of God. How many of you had that in your wedding ceremony? Probably a lot. Nobody? Come on, you did. I did a bunch of your weddings, okay? So check this out in your notes. God cannot, you cannot expect God to bless your mess if you're unwilling to follow his plan. Let me say that again. You cannot expect God to bless your mess if you're unwilling to follow his plan. You know why we follow God's plan? Because it's old, right? Because it's, you know, no. We follow God's plan because it works. We follow God's plan because God's blessing is on. You know why God gives us these plans? God gives it to us because it's for our best. We don't put rules and restrictions on our kids to be mean, do we? Well, maybe sometimes. No. No, we do it because we love them and we want there to be boundaries in order for them to be protected. The same is true with God. He's the perfect loving father and he puts, uh, he puts rules and he puts regulations in our lives in order to protect us. Chapter two of our story here today. Chapter two, love bears all things. Love bears all things. So Sarah becomes really, really, really abusive with Hagar. She's like, listen, listen, listen. You may be pregnant with the baby, but I'm still the mistress of the house. And so Sarah begins to become very abusive towards Hagar. And Hagar becomes unable to bear Sarah's mistreatment any longer, and she attempts to return to her homeland of Egypt, and she attempts to to just go out into the desert, and she's going to go out through the desert, and she's going home to Egypt. And as she's leaving, she stops at a fountain of water near the city of Kadesh, where she is met by an angel of the Lord. And the angel finds her, the angel rebukes her, the angel commands her to return, and he promises that God will provide a nation through her son Ishmael. He gives her a blessing. Now, this is where greatness is born. Out of this interaction, out of this moment is where greatness is born. Hagar, the Egyptian servant, becomes the real heroine now because she puts aside her best interest in order for her son's best to be realized. She puts aside her mistreatment in order for her son's welfare to be assured. She obeyed God's command for her son's sake. There's times as parents, we just have to suck things up, right, because it's the right thing to do for our kids. There's sometimes we just have to do things, don't we, moms and dads, that are uncomfortable for us, but they're the right things for our children. There's times where we can't take that job because it would put our children or put our family not in the right place. It would be great for us as individuals, but we understand that we got to do the right thing for our family. And there's, this is a moment like that for Hagar. She has to put aside her her concerns, her welfare, what would be best for her, and she has to take care of her son, Ishmael. Check this out. I didn't put this in your notes, but I would, I would really encourage you to write this in. See, Hagar's circumstances didn't change. She was still going back to Sarah's abuse and mistreatment. Her circumstances didn't change, but you know what did change? She did. She did. She went back to Sarah and to Abraham with a new purpose. She went back with a renewed sense that she could get through this. She went back with a goal, with a target in mind. She returned. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, says a lot of things about what real love is. Here's one of the things that we should expect from love. From verse 7, it says this, love endures through every circumstance. Love endures through every circumstance circumstance. See, we have a tendency to believe that because God loves us, everything should go our way, don't we? If God loves me, everything should be bubble gum and roses. If, if God's love, then why do bad things happen in the world? If God's love, then why don't I get what I want? If God's love, then why aren't all of us rich? And why aren't all of us popular? And why aren't all of us fulfilled? And why, if God's love, why doesn't it happen for me? But that's not what real love is, is it? 
Maybe, just maybe, if we love God and we trust him, then it's we who need to change rather than the circumstances changing on our behalf. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what? My husband and I, we love God, but we're having a hard time in our marriage. Why doesn't he change? Why doesn't God change her? Why doesn't God change him? Why doesn't God change them? And God's saying, you know what? Hey, listen, listen, here's a key. If you want your circumstances to get 50% better today, you ready? You change. Because if there's two people and it's 100% messed up, if one of you changes, guess what happens? Your circumstances get 50% better immediately. And maybe God's saying, if you'll take the first step and you'll be the one who will follow after me, and you'll be the one who follows after my commands, not, not expecting the circumstances to change. And we could talk about work circumstances. We could talk about financial circumstances. We could talk about your health circumstances. We could talk about your marital circumstances. We could talk about your work environment, whatever. But catch this. If you'll change and you'll start following after God instead of griping and complaining and using your prayer time to whine about how bad everything is. And listen, God understands. But maybe God's saying, I'm using the circumstance and I'm using the problem or I'm using this health problem that you're going through right now. I'm using it so you'll change. And all of a sudden, you'll find that your circumstances will begin to change too. And it won't happen overnight. It won't happen immediately. But when you meet God and you begin to do what God commands you to do, your circumstances automatically get better from your perspective. Now I wonder in your notes, how can we expect to experience God's promises if we reject his commands? How can we expect to experience God's promises if we reject his commands? Scripture tells us, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear, I'll heal their land forgive their sins, right? We keep praying for God to heal our land. Now this week we went through a terrible, terrible set of circumstances in our country, amen? And a lot of us, and a few of you as you came in today, you talked about how heartbroken you are about the circumstances of our country. And I don't want to sound hard here, okay? But we cannot expect God to come and heal our land if we don't do what he commands us to do in the first place. Okay, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, turn from their wicked way, seek my face, then, then I'll heal their land. And we pray for God to heal our land, but we don't want to humble ourselves, we don't want to pray, and we don't want to seek his face. God says he'll come. God promises that he'll heal our land. God promises that he'll do that. We as believers need to begin to seek God's face. We need to begin to pray that God will heal our land. But we also have to humble ourselves. Listen, the biggest thing that's going on in, our, uh, in the race relations in our country right now is simply this. We won't humble ourselves. We won't humble ourselves with one another and serve one another and be a blessing to one another. And that goes black, white, brown, yellow, people who paint their hair pink. Doesn't matter. We need to humble ourselves to one another, serve one another, and be a blessing to one another. Amen? You guys are quiet. Look at the person next to you and say, man, he's preaching this morning. <laughs> okay. Let me give you some practical application here, Travis. This can go up on the parents who won't lose a little sleep to take their children to church. May one do, day lose much sleep to get them out of trouble. That got an amen. Yeah. Oh, you know, pastor, I work six days a week. I, uh, okay, come talk to I was a youth pastor for 15 years. I'll tell you what I didn't have. I didn't have a lot of parents who took their kids to church every week come to me with their kids in trouble. 15 years, I'm telling you, 15 years I didn't have parents who brought their kids out to youth group and out to service on Sunday mornings and brought them to Sunday school. I didn't see a lot of those kids getting into a lot of trouble. But I'll tell you, I saw a lot of parents who didn't bring their kids and they had every excuse. We had to be on the boat. It's the summer. We have to, we have to use the boat. We got to be out on the boat. And in the fall, we got to be at football practice. And in the winter, we got to be at basketball practice. And then we got to go to Taekwondo. And we got to go to Little Susie's whatever. I don't know what little Susie does. I grew up with five brothers, okay? Four brothers. 
And my kids were in church, so I don't know what little Susie does on Sunday mornings, okay? Brownie bake sales. I don't know. You catching me? I don't know why. I don't know what went wrong. Maybe if you took an hour and a half, two hours out of your Sunday morning and brought them to church and got them around other believers and around kids who are believers and their parents are believers and they're in the atmosphere. All I know is, listen, 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 listen. All I know is this, okay? Your percentage goes way up if you get your kids to church. Now, that doesn't mean be the parent that comes, get out, and you go off. A whole bunch of you going, okay, I'll bring my kids to church. Get out. I'm going back to bed. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. Get out. Come to church. Seek God. We just had a family who dedicated their baby to the Lord, and they said, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that our children are in an environment where they can come to know Christ. Now, I'm going to turn around to say this. There's a whole bunch of you who I've done your baby dedications, and I never see you on Sunday mornings. You made a promise to God that you are not keeping, and don't come crying to God when it doesn't work out for you the way you want it to. You cannot expect to experience God's promises while you reject his commands. Do you still love me? Okay, now, we're going to fast forward a few chapters in Genesis and a few years in the story, and Sarah has now had her own child, a son. His name is Isaac, and Isaac and Ishmael are half-brothers, and they live in the same home, but they have two different mothers who, of course, are in two opposite stations of life. Now, we're going to read this. In your notes, we're going to read this. We're going to pick the pace up a little bit here. When Isaac grew up and he was about to be weaned, Abraham prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham, and her Egyptian servant Hagar making fun of her son Isaac. So she turned to Abraham and demanded, and I wish I could just get one of those really whiny woman voices right here, right? Get rid of that slave woman and her son, right? I'll get you and your little dog too. He's not going to share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. I won't have it. Here's our upstanding guy, Abraham. You ready? This upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son. But God told Abraham, do not be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you, for Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. But I will also make a nation of the descendants of Hagar's son because he is your son too. You ever heard of the Palestinians? They're descendants of Ishmael. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food in a container of water, strapped them on Hagar's, Hagar's shoulders. Can you see this? Then he sent her away with her son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. I, it's like, Abraham, you're killing me, dude. Just straps on a backpack. Go! Hope it goes well, right? Well, it doesn't. Verse 15. Then when the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush. She went and sat by herself about 100 yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said, as she burst into tears. But God heard the boy crying. There's a sermon right there. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. Hagar, what's wrong? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him, comfort him, for I will make him a great nation from his descendants. And then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. He became a skillful archer, and he settled in the wilderness of Paran. His mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. Chapter 3 of our story this morning. Obeying is hard, isn't it? See, Hagar returns, sees her son brought up as Abraham's heir, so that's where we left off. Then Sarah bears the son Isaac, and all of a sudden, Ishmael goes from the only son, even though he's the firstborn, he becomes subordinate to Isaac because he's married to Sarah. So he is the heir to everything that is Abraham's. So there's two heirs, but Isaac is going to receive all the birthright as the firstborn, even though he's not. Then they go to the Feast of Weaning. Ishmael makes fun of the baby Isaac. Sarah snaps and demands his removal. 
Abraham objects, but God tells him that it has to be this way. And hastily, he pushes Hagar and Ishmael out with meager rations. That's the part that kills me. You're in the desert. Why would you just give them a donkey, give, you know, take care of them? But Abraham doesn't even take care of his heir. The water is gone and the thirst is pressing down and Hagar resigns herself and the boy to death, making him as comfortable as possible when the angel speaks to her, scolds her and leads her to a well of water. God kept his promise and spared Hagar and Ishmael. Now I'm gonna give you quick, two quick truths from this part of our story this morning in your notes. Listen, it's our responsibilities, moms, dads, everybody here as Christ followers, it's our responsibility to do our best. Hagar was just doing what she could. Hagar was doing her best, but she was, she was blocked at every turn, wasn't she? She kept trying to do what was right. She kept trying to provide for her son, but she fell short. So listen to this. We have to, after we've done our best, we have to let God do his best with us. And that's what I was talking about with Ben this morning. You know what? We don't always feel strong, but you know what? There comes a point when we run out of ourselves. There comes a point where there's no more of us left. There comes a point where we can't provide everything that our family and our children and our spouse, they need. And that's when we have to rely on God. That's when we have to rely on God. Moms and dads, your your resources, no matter how vast they may be, are going to be stretched at some point beyond what you can do emotionally, physically, financially, spiritually. They're going to be as far as you can go, but that's the point where God takes over. You can't access what you're not connected to, though. You cannot access what you're connected to. Guess what? If you have your banking at Wells Fargo, you can't go to TD Bank and make a withdrawal, right? Because you don't have assets there. As a matter of fact, we have a word for that here in America. It's called stealing, and you're going to jail, right? When you, take, when you access something that you haven't placed assets in, right, they take you out in handcuffs, And sometimes, and a lot of times, we try to do this spiritually. We want, I talked about this a little bit already, we want God to bless us, but we've done nothing to put into our account. We want all of the promises of God without putting in anything. And listen, we can't steal from God. We can't take, you can't all of a sudden fall down on your knees and go, God, I I haven't talked to you in forever. You see that in the movies? I haven't talked to you. And forever, but I know you're there, right? Sometimes it works out, but very seldom because God goes, hello, I don't know you. I wish I did. I probably did at one point, but I don't know who you are. And we think we can access what we haven't put assets into. Secondly, listen to this. I think this is so cool. The restoring fountain was always there. It didn't all of a sudden show up. God just pointed it out to Hagar. It was always there. The water, the supply that she needed was always, there's a great truth in that. What you need from God is always there. Always. But you have to have eyes to see, ears to hear. You have to be spiritually in tune to see it. And to receive it. Amen? See, when we're submitted to his will and we're following him, we'll find fountains of restoration have always been made available to us and to our children. But catch this. You won't find them when you're wandering around a desert trying to escape your circumstances. It's when we sit down and listen to the the voice of God that we find rest and relief. Fourth chapter, last one. You ready? And... They lived. Now, I want you to notice, I didn't say, and they lived happily ever after. They didn't. I'm going to invite the, uh, I'm going to invite Numa to come down now. They didn't live happily ever after. As a matter of fact, it says in Scripture that Ishmael had a hard life. He had a tough time. He fought with everybody. He was a knucklehead. From early on. It seemed like he had a tough time. But 
out of those struggles and out of those difficulties, he always still had God's blessing on his life. Here's the truth here. Don't think that your struggles and difficulties are a sign of God's hand of blessing being lifted from you. Perhaps, perhaps the struggles are leaving a legacy of blessing and provision for the generations to follow you. See, Ishmael lived, he lived a rugged, independent life and it gendered a nation of people who could withstand difficulty, that could withstand struggle, that, w- that w- could withstand tough times. It was birthed from Ishmael. But they thrived, and God's hand of blessing has been upon them. See, I guess this story makes me wonder, if God could bless Ishmael as the father of a great nation, and his mother didn't have the kind of relationship that each one of us has access to with God through Christ Jesus, then what could God do with well-taught sons and daughters of godly mothers and fathers who are heirs of God in Christ Jesus. If God's hand of blessing could be on Ishmael, despite the fact that his father and his mother had a lot of flaws, and despite the fact they didn't have access to Jesus Christ, what could God do through your children? What could God do through your grandchildren? What kind of blessing could you pass on to the generations that follow you if you go hard after God if you follow after him if you make him the priority of your life if you make him the priority of your marriage if you make him the priority of your home what could God do you could be the father you could be the mother you could be the grandfather you could be the grandmother of a great 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 nation of a generation that knows God, of a generation of blessing, of a generation that seeks after and knows the heartbeat and the voice of God. It was a mother's love in trying times that passed on the blessing to Ishmael. What could God do through you? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you just begin to work in hearts and lives right now. I ask that you would fill the longings of our heart. Lord, I pray that we would understand that when we go hard after you, when we pursue you, that you never, you never leave us empty. You never leave us unsatisfied. You never leave us destitute, wandering alone when we follow after you. There's always fountains of restoration. There's always a place where we can be restored. There's a place that we can pass on a godly legacy to our children. So I pray this morning, pray for every parent, every grandparent here, that you would make us mothers and fathers and grandparents of godly children. If you're here this morning, if you're here this morning, you're a mom and a dad and you say, you know what? No matter how old your kids are, no matter where your kids are in their life, if you want to be a father, a mother, a grandparent of godly children, I'm going to ask you to just stand where you're at. Even if you don't have kids yet, but you want God's anointing and blessing to be upon your home, would you just stand? Because I want to pray a blessing upon you this morning. As I pray, just cry out to God, Lord, whatever deficiencies we have. Abraham and Sarah, they are models of deficiency. And yet you birth great nations from them. Hagar, great deficiencies, and yet you birth a great nation out of her. God, what could you do through moms and dads, grandparents, aunts, uncles, future moms and dads in this room? that go hard after you, that seek after you, that desire you and long for you more than any other thing. God, what could you do? 
What kind of legacy could we leave? Lord, I pray a blessing upon each home, upon each parent, each grandparent here this morning. I pray that you would use us. Birth something within us today that would say, as for me and my house, as Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. It won't be something we try to do. It's something we will do. It will become the priority. It will become the passion of our hearts to follow after you, to serve you, to model godliness and righteousness for our children and our grandchildren and to pass on to them godly living. Homes that are full of peace. Marriages that work, not because two people are perfect, but because we love you and we put you first and we value our marriages. God, we're not putting our kids first, we're putting you first and we're trusting you to take care of our children. We're trusting you, just as Hagar did. Out there in the wilderness, you provided a fountain. Lord, in those times when we are bankrupt in ourselves, we pray that you would provide what's necessary and what's needed, God. Because we've placed into the spiritual bank, we've placed good things. Thank you, Lord, for our moms and dads and grandparents here today. I pray, Father, that you would bless them and keep them. I pray that your face would shine down upon them and that you would give them not only peace, but you'd give them wisdom and strength and endurance. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.